yeah, normally, yeah, no, it's all right. I'm going to get into the message. I want to, I want to take you real quick uh, on a really quick tour here of the last couple of uh, months of Wednesday night where we talked about the keys to answered prayer. And, and then let me remind you that th this isn't like keys to answered prayer. Man, I gotta, if I unlock that lock and unlock this lock and unlock that, God has to do it. Man, the door's going to open. And God, that's, not exactly what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is for us to be on praying ground, for us to be right with the Lord, for us to ha have opportunity to come before Him boldly, there are some things that we need to consider and, and be concerned about, uh, and uh, having our heart right and having the right approach uh, is a key to getting God's ear uh, and not offending Him in the process, and yes, a key to answered prayer. But it's not like a lot of times a lot of religions teach, well, all you got to do is say this and say it this way, and all of a sudden, abracadabra, God has to do it. It's just like a rubbing the genie in the bottle kind of thing, and that is not the way God works. Um, God works through relationship. And what we're talking about in these keys is really how do we have a good relationship with God? Uh, and, uh, and so you need to have that close relationship uh, with God. If, uh, if, a, if a kid comes to me and says, uh, can I borrow the car? My relationship with them is going to be the determining factor in whether they're going to get to borrow the car or not. All right? Now understand something. If I don't know this kid, it's an easy answer. Right? And sometimes if I know them, it's an easy answer. But it really is hinged on the relationship. Right? Um, so I, I'm, that's what we're talking about. How do we have that relationship with the Lord where we can come boldly in and, and stand at the feet of our Father and, and have a conversation and, and have His ears open and have our hearts right so that we can accomplish something in this relationship. And so that's really where I'm coming at from this. And so I just want to touch, we're on key number 10 tonight. And there could probably be 20, but we're on key number 10. And, uh, and I, I'm not going to speak just a whole long time on that, but I want to review with you tonight. The first thing, and probably one of the big keys, is we need to have our sins con uh, uh, confessed. Uh, if we don't have our sins confessed, we're in, uh, not on praying ground. Psalm 66 and verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, it says the Lord will not hear me. He will not hear me. How can you have your prayers answered if he's not going to hear you? The second key was pray without selfishness. We learn from James 4, 1 through 3, it says, From whence come wars, fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust, ye have not, ye kill, ye desire to have, ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. And we are a lustful society. We're a selfish uh, uh, lot, and, and, and it's ingrained in us from youth that uh, we, we need to get what we want. And that is just not the way it is. So we need to be careful as we're approaching God, we, and we need to not be selfish in our prayer time. Uh, the third key was we need to pray in Jesus' name. And we, we spent some time explaining that and exploring that and understand that that simply, uh, yes, I use in Jesus' name at the end of my communication with God. Uh, I sign my prayer off with in Jesus' name. That's more of a reminder for me than it is to him. But at the same time, uh, I know this, I'm coming to him because of Jesus. And if it wasn't because of Jesus, I couldn't come to him. Jesus is the one that invited me. Jesus is the one that said, go talk to my father and tell him that I sent you. And so when we talk to, when we talk to the father, we're coming in the name and in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 14, 13 and 14, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the father may be glorified in the son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, and so, again, it's part of our... Uh, our prayers, part of our heart attitude as we approach God. 
in the throne room of God. And then number four was pray having faith. And I know that seems uh, obvious, but it's really not. Mark eleven twenty to 24, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree, which thou cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be ye removed, be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. All right? Now, that's, again, that's not name it and claim it. That's not what we're talking about. But we're saying, come, having a confidence that I'm going to talk to a, a, a God, and he, my God can do whatever my God wants to do. And so there is great power and potential in my approach to God when I come the right way. Key number five, pray having forgiven others. Uh, if we don't have a right, right relationship with others, and we're going to talk more about that tonight, more specifically about that, but... Uh, if we don't forgive others, we're not going to be on praying on ground because our sins won't be forgiven. Mark eleven twenty five and 26, And when, the, uh, when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Notice it didn't say in there, uh, forgive them uh, if they ask for forgiveness. It said if you want your prayers answered, you must forgive. Uh, you're not on praying ground if we're not forgiving uh, of other people, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. They certainly don't. Regardless of whether they approached you right or said the right thing, we must relinquish <clears throat> that um, over their heads and be gracious to them because that's what Jesus was with uh, everyone. Number six, pray according to God's will. First John five fourteen, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Uh, according to God's will, what does God want? When Jesus uh, concluded his prayer time, he said, not my will, but thine be done. And we need to have the same approach to God is, hey, here's what I think needs to happen. But understand, I can see about that far in front of my face. And maybe not even near that much, where God sees the whole thing. God knows what's best. And we can, we can cry out to God, and we can pour our hearts out to God, but uh, we need to trust Him to do what's right and what needs to be done, but pray according to God's will. Uh, and we said in there, don't, <laughs> there's no need to ask God to do something He's already said in His Word that He's not going to do. So we don't need to even approach those things. Number seven was pray with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We need to pray being thankful. You know, if we just really are honest, God has blessed us beyond uh, our ability to even comprehend it all, but we need to comprehend some of it, and we need to be thankful for all of it that we can even think of and know that uh, he's done so much more than we can even grasp. Number eight was pray abiding in Christ. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. John fifteen seven, And we spent some time talking about that. Abiding, living, remaining, dwelling. That is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't have a relationship, friend, you're not renting the car, you're not borrowing the car for tonight. You need to have a relationship with the Son. Kiss the Son, the Bible says. So number nine was pray being a generous giver. We talked about that last week. Proverbs twenty one thirteen. Whosoever stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Uh, and so understand that God expects us to be gracious to those around us, uh, to minister and meet needs uh, of those around us. And if we have a hardened, cold heart and are unwilling to be a blessing to anybody else, then uh, when we go and say, God, I need, he's going to say, you what? So we need to be uh, willing to take the blessings God has poured into our life and share them with those around us. We need to be generous uh, with those around us. So let's get to key number 10 tonight, and we're going to turn to 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3, 
And again, I, I'm hoping that I can share this in, in short order. I would say this uh, tonight as well. Uh, all of these are on our YouTube channel. You could go back and, and look at these. I think it would be a great thing to go back and study them and uh, consider them, especially, you know, just spend some time talking uh, to the Lord and learning about prayer. I think there's a lot more that could be, we could do a lot more with it, and uh, we should. Uh, we should be praying often. And so uh, go back and listen to those and take notes and learn. And I'm certainly nobody special, but I think that God's Word has given us something there that we need to uh, really take to heart. First John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, if uh, you've gotten comfortable, now would be a good time to stand up, stretch your legs, <clears throat> if you have the opportunity to do that. First John 3, verses 22 and 23, I'll pray and you can be seated again. It says, um, 1 John 3, 22 and 23. All right. Um, okay. I'm having trouble focusing my eyes. Is why I, I, that doesn't make sense. Oh, here we go. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Verse 23 gives us the clue and the keys here, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandment. What's the commandment? One, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Two, love one another. We want to talk about having a right relationship with others tonight, and that is a key to answered prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we are so grateful for your love and mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness and salvation that you offered us through Christ. And we're thankful that we have that opportunity to receive that salvation and know for sure that we're eternally secure and saved in your hands. Nobody can remove us from that. But Father, tonight we, we often, like that man that uh, that, that got forgiveness from his master and turned around and, and held his uh, fellow uh, servant uh, captive and, and threw him in prison because he wouldn't forgive his debt. Father, we often are unforgiving and we don't have a good relationship with those around us and it hinders our prayer. I pray that you'd help us with this thought tonight. I pray that you'd instruct us in this area. And then, Father, I pray that if there's some of us, uh, if there's any of us, if, if we have these issues, that, Father, we would uh, have a renewed uh, willingness to get things right with our brothers and sisters and, and with our fellow man so that you can be pleased and that your ears will be open to our cry. We do need you, and uh, w we need to have this key in our lives so that you can uh, be open and, and we can uh, get the help that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's talk about this for a few minutes, and, and uh, there's a great deal of information in the Scriptures about having a relationship uh, with others, all right? We're, if we're going to have our prayers answered, it's gonna, it says because we keep His commandments. Well, yeah, of course, we've got to do what He says, we gotta, but what does He say? The thing specifically in the context of this passage, yes, believe on, the, on, on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but a lot of people would say, oh, I'm, I'm a believer, well, that's fine, but what about this next thing? Loving one another. Um, <clears throat> it, it's not an option, by the way. And it's not a feeling either, just so you know. Loving one another is the decision that we make. It's not because they're lovable. It's not because they're nice. It's not because they're good-looking. It's not because uh, 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 that they did something for us. It's because... Jesus loved me, so I ought to love you. Whether you've done something nice for me or whether you've been ornery to me, I still ought to love you. You realize as Jesus walked around and people you know, mistreated him, made false accusations against him, and all of those things at any given time, he could have, he could have just had the thought go through his mind, dead. Just like that tree, they'd have dried up on the spot. You think about the kindness and the love of God that is demonstrated through Christ's life, and he's hanging on the cross even. 
if you be the Son of God, come down from there. As they're spitting on him, as they're mocking him, as they're even driving the nails in their hands, their hands could have withered up uh, as they went to strike the nail. But his love can be seen in the fact that he didn't strike out. He didn't lash out. He didn't even have an evil thought against them because if he had 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 a bad thought about those people, they'd have been dead instantly. We say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. Well, we need to learn to love others like Jesus loved others. We need to maintain a good relationship with others. It's a priority. It ought to be a priority. It's a priority for God. It ought to be a priority for us. And so if we don't have our prayers hindered, we need to, we must. Let's look at a couple of different aspects of this tonight. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. There's a a good bit of instruction here for us um, in our relationships. Now, if you're going to be ornery with somebody, all right, if you're going to be ornery with somebody, who is probably the most likely person that you'll ever be ornery with? Those that are closest to you. Isn't that sad? We'll te- treat us total stranger with niceness, get the door for them, and as soon as they're out of the way, we will chew the backside off of our spouse or off of our kids or off of somebody else that we know. Isn't that a tragedy? Mm. And I'm, I'm trying to be nice tonight. I'm trying to use nice words. You know, I'm trying to say it in a nice way. But sometimes we're not really that nice, are we? Not really. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever been guilty of that because, well, that'd be silly because we'd all have to raise our hands. So there's no point. Ephesians chapter 5, notice with me verse 22, please. Ephesians 5, 22. In verse number 1, he said, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Now, uh, there's a great deal of information in this passage about that, but let's jump right to it tonight. Because we need, to, we need to move along. It says in verse number uh, 22, Ephesians 5, 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I'm thankful it doesn't say, Wives, you have to submit to all men. It just says you have to submit to your husband. You say, You don't know my husband. Well, I didn't marry him. Good thing, right? Hey, uh, you need to check them guys out before you go getting hitched to them. I'm just telling you. But it says submit to them, all right? Don't argue with me about it. I didn't write it. God did. He said, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the uh, church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, we'll stop there, and we'll get to the other side of this in a moment, but just understand something, wives. It, it, your prayers will be hindered if you don't have a right relationship with your husband. If you're not submitting to your husband, and you go, oh, God, would you help me with my jerk of a husband? Well, why would he do that? See, because to be on praying ground as a wife, you've got to be submitting to your husband. Um, That's just not an egotistical idea that I came up with. That's what God says. And he is your Savior, and he is your God, and he's your creator, and he's the one that has the authority to say that. I didn't set it up. He did. But the point is this. If we want to have our prayers answered, if we want to be on praying ground, and if we want to pray for our husband, who probably is a jerk, just about every husband I've ever met, including myself, is a jerk. So I'm pretty sure your husband is a jerk which is an even better reason why you need to submit to him, get in a right relationship with him, and then talk to the Lord about it. But notice it goes on to say in the next verse, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And, and the man says, but well, you don't know my wife. And I say, again, I didn't marry her. You say, well, she's all messed up. Well, it's your fault. It says so right there in the text. 
Christ is about helping his bride become the, the one that she needs to be. And as a, as a husband, it's my job to help my wife to be what she should be. So if my wife isn't what she ought to be, whose fault is it? Don't say her parents because that's not true. That's not what it says. All right? That's not what it says. And I don't have time to get into all the details of that, but... You know, the, the reality is, the bottom line here is, we need to have a right relationship with our spouse. And by the way, your wife isn't going to change because you beat her over the head with your ideas and your leadership, and your husband's not going to become the sweetest, kindest, gentlest person uh, because you tell him he's a jerk all the time. And neither one of you is going to have your prayers answered until you get your heart right about your position in this thing and you get before God in, in a humble and gracious way and start praying like we should pray. All right. Consider with me 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. Turn back on to the right there. <clears throat> It says in verse number 1, 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. I'm glad God is consistent. He says it the same way. You just have to listen to your husband. Listen, all men are jerks. It's a good thing you don't have to listen to all of them. You don't have to pay attention really closely to one of them. That if any obey not the word, right there, you know what that means? He's a jerk. They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wife. Conversation is a word that means lifestyle or living. In other words, if your husband isn't acting right, that's not a big surprise to God. He knew that already. Uh, and if you will be what you can be, then you will help him to become what he's supposed to be. Isn't that interesting? He may without the word be won by the living, the lifestyle, and the conversation of the wife. Jump down to verse number 7. Notice it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. A lot of guys have said, well, I don't understand women. Well, listen, you don't have to understand all of them, but you ought to try to get to understand one of them. You ought to try to get to understand one of them. It's a good thing that wives don't have to submit to all men, and it's a good thing that men don't have to understand all women. But you do have to strive to understand one of them, and, and that would be your wife. And notice what it says. He says, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, treating her as that precious flower that she is, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. See, if our relationship isn't, isn't right with our spouses, if husbands aren't loving their wives and, and, and treating them with the honor and, and, and respect and, and tenderness that they need to be dealt with in, and I'm not telling you I'm perfect at this. I'll admit right before all of you, my wife and my kids included, that I, I'm still working on this because it's a challenge because it's easy to get sideways with the people that are closest to you. But here is the key. We need to, we want our prayers answered and we want to get God's ear when we have need. Well, we can't forsake the relationships. And we need to set those as a priority, uh, especially in the husband-wife relationship. And we'll go beyond that here in a moment. But wives uh, submitting and husbands loving. And if we don't do this, we're disobeying God's command in this area. And we're hindering our prayers from being answered. Now, turn back to Ephesians again with me. And let's look at beyond the husband and wife relationship because as i said in the beginning we need to be concerned about all of our relationships all of our human relationships are really hanging on this thing this key this key of answered prayer of having right relationships is bumpy like one of my keys in my pocket and there's a lot of things and yes the biggest bump uh, that we probably face as human beings is the husband and wife relationship because that's the one that's closest and they know us the best and we tend to treat them the worst that's probably the biggest part to this key but there's other parts to the key there's other bumps on this key 
One of them we see in Ephesians 6, 1. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, young people, if, if you want God to hear your prayer, and you might have parents that are not perfect. You might. I mean, most parents I know are perfect, but you might have a set that's not. No, I haven't met a perfect set of parents yet. There aren't any perfect parents. Sometimes we have this tendency to think, well, man, such and such has really great parents and mine stink. No, listen, they all stink, right? And that's just the way it is because they're humans and they're not perfect. They never have been and they aren't going to be. But uh, the truth of the matter is if you want to have your prayers answered, And you want to be right with God so that he hears you when you get on your knees and on your face before him. You need to have a good relationship with your parents. You ought to obey them. That's what it says. He says in verse 2, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Honor them. Honor them. Because they are your parents. God didn't give you to others a different set of parents. He gave you to the ones that you have. He brought you into their life. And, and, and they're investing in you, and they may not be perfect. I'm, I'm certain that they're not. They probably have plenty of faults. I know I do, but I know this. They love you, and I know it's a, it, this too. It's a key to getting your prayers answered that you honor and obey them. Okay, And if you don't honor and obey them, you're going to have a hard time not just with them but with God. And I, you can have a bad time with your parents, but having a bad time with God is... That's eternal in, in consequence. So you need to understand this key of having a good relationship with your parents. And uh, moving on there, and he says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. See, it's not just all on the children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Sir, uh, uh, we'll stop with verse number four there. Uh, the parents need to have a right relationship with their children. You realize, parents, if you don't do your best before God with your children, then your prayers will be hindered as well. See, these relationships are twofold. There's two sides to this. And both sides, we need to be the best we can for the Lord if we want to go before the Lord and say, God, would you bless my child? God, would you help my child? We need to be in a right relationship with our child and with God. Moving on there then. It says in verse 5, Servants, obey them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Remember what we said in our opening verses? The commandment, we need to obey God's commandment. Well, what's his commandment? Well, we have a good relationship. And in this area, he says that as servants, as employees, we need to treat our employer the right way and and don't just work when they're watching us, but work when they're not watching us. We need to be faithful in our tasks, whatever they happen to be, as if it were we were working for God himself. Christian employees ought to be the best employees anywhere. They ought to be the best employees anywhere. By the way, by and large, that's not the testimony. That's not the testimony. So I want to encourage you tonight. Listen, if we want to have our prayers answered, and I'm sure we do, then we need to strive to be in a good relationship. Husband and wife, parents and children, employees and employers going on in this verse. And notice, again, it's a uh, dual-sided responsibility here. Uh, The employees have a a side of responsibility, but so do the employers. Verse 8, knowing that whatsoever good thing uh, any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. And ye masters, in verse 9, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So the, the... bosses also have a responsibility and say, well, my boss isn't even saved. Well, then you need to show him. Just like the wives can win the husbands by the conversation of the wife, the employees can speak to the bosses by their conversation and their conduct, and we can make a difference in their lives. We need to have a good testimony, and it's important so that we have our prayers answered. 
I think we can go one step more or beyond these relationships because these relationships that we've talked about are personal relationships that we tie ourselves to. We marry somebody. We have children. We get a job and work for somebody. And by the way, uh, once you marry your spouse, you're stuck with her. And once you have ki- children, you're stuck with them. But you can get a different boss. You can get some different employees. So let's take it one step beyond this. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12 and verse 31. We'll just cover one more area tonight. One more circle should get us around the globe tonight, and we'll have covered every possible relationship that we could possibly talk about with this one more verse. Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 12, and notice with me verse 31. Mark 12, verse 31. And this this passage, we could talk about Uh, back verse 28 and one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together he perceived and that uh, he had answered them well asked him well uh, which is the first commandment of all and jesus answered the the first commandment is here o israel the lord our god is one lord and thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And, verse 31, the second is like unto it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So I said we're going to step out and make this circle big enough to go around the world. We need to love our neighbors. Listen, if we don't have a good uh, relationship with our fellow man, whoever they might be, then we have a problem with God and our, hairs, uh, our, our prayers may be hindered. In fact, they will be hindered. Jesus explained um, who we should consider our neighbor uh, in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 29 where they were tempting him and, and, and the lawyer said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told that story about the, uh, the man that had been beaten and left by the side of the road for dead. And, and the priest went by and the Levite went by. And finally, the Samaritan went by. And the Samaritan uh, helped the man. And he asked the crowd, who then is, was neighbor to this man? You don't have to know him for them to be your neighbor. They don't have to live next door for them to be your neighbor. They could be a complete stranger. You've never met, you don't know their name, you don't know anything about them, and if they have a need, then God says they're your neighbor. And understand this, we cannot expect God to answer our prayers unless and until we have right relationships and we diligently seek to obey His commandments and obey His Word. And part of that, a big part of that, the second greatest commandment, in fact, is having a good relationship with others. You know, there's a lot of folks that have problems with just about, just about everybody they come in contact with. We say, well, it's pride, and it is. It's selfishness, and it is. It's a relationship problem. And we, that person also has a problem getting their prayers answered. Because God says in order to have prayers answered, we need to be in a good relationship with others. In all of these different ways that we've talked about over the last couple of months, I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time on my knees. We're commanded to pray. We're expected to pray. But when I do it, I want to be effective in it. And to be effective in it, I need to strive. And, And again, you're looking at a human being tonight. I'm not telling you the... I'm not raising the bar higher than, than uh, it ought to be raised, I don't think. I think I'm putting it right where God said that it should be. And I'm telling you that I often can't reach the bar myself, to be honest with you. But we all ought to be working at jumping that high, doing just that, because it's a commandment of God. It's an expectation of God. So keys to answered prayer. There's 10 of them. I do hope that this will change. It certainly could change our prayer time, our prayer lives, uh, and the lives of other people. Because let's face it, right now we're praying for folks that 
that need prayer. They need God. There, there's no help for them outside of that. We'll hear a praise tonight. A little Paisley got to go home from the hospital. I don't know all the details of that. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. But that's a God thing. You know, people in need need someone to pray. And if we're going to be a help to anybody, we need to get on praying ground, and we need to have these keys in our hands, so to speak, and we need to be talking to God on, in an acceptable way. So I want to encourage you. I know there's a lot here, and there's a lot to this. Uh, and um, just teaching it, by the way, doesn't fix it. We've got to go home tonight with our spouse, with our kids. We've got to go down the road with our neighbors. And uh, we're tested on this every day and all day long. But I want to encourage you tonight. We need to strive for this. So part of our prayer needs to be, God, help me with this. Help me with this relationship thing. Help me with giving and being generous with others. Help me to, to uh, you know, I, if you're not saved, obviously you need to get saved. I was teasing Andrew tonight about preaching. And he said, well, I can preach a salvation message. I said, oh, everybody here tonight saved. I'm sure of that. But I'm not really. But I'd like to think everybody here tonight saved. Listen, if you're not saved, you're not on praying ground. How's your prayer life? I hope, I trust that you're taking notes, not just of the sermon, but of the prayer list. We print them in the bulletin. And by the way, that's not just to take up space. We want people praying for those things, right? Where'd it go? Right in there, right under the calendar. We want people to pray for those things. We want to get together next Wednesday night and hear some praise reports on how God met those needs. I look forward to that. So to do that, we need to pray effectively. Let me pray with you tonight. Father, I want to thank you for this group and thank you for this series of messages and, and this study has helped me. I pray that it would help each and every one of these and that uh, you would be... Uh, able to hear from and, and have your ears open to and your heart open to us because we've got on praying ground. We've gotten some things straightened out in our own hearts and our own lives and, and uh, we're more pleasing in your sight and you, you now are more prone to uh, hearing and answering our prayers. But Father, we pray for your blessing and your help. We're still weak. We're still frail. We still don't do it right all the time. And so I pray that you continue to